Bonjour à tout le monde. Euh, mon nom est Sofar Kornet, je suis le directeur du Centre de recherche mathématique. So, hello everyone, I'm the director of the Centre de recherche mathématique. And um, I want to say a few words about the lectures uh, today, about the Centre also, and to welcome uh, Ruth Chayari as our speaker today. So, the Centre de recherche mathématique was uh, founded in 1968. And uh, two years later, this uh, series, uh, Andre Eidenstadt series, were uh, launched. So it's a series of three conferences given by some very distinguished researchers in a specific subject, with one lecture that is for a uh, uh, general audience. And uh, it carries the name of a uh, of, uh, generous uh, benefactor of the math community here. Uh, Andre Eisenstadt, and uh, who was a uh, successful uh, businessman and also uh, an uh, enthusiast uh, amateur mathematician. So uh, there were uh, many distinguished uh, uh, speakers in the setting of these lectures along the years. And starting in the 1970s, these lectures were associated to thematic semesters like the one on geometric group theory that we have uh, uh, this uh, spring, uh, summer, winter. Sometimes the semester here is called winter for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. But, uh, now we have the summer already. And um, so we are very happy to uh, welcome today Professor Ruscherny, who is the Theodore and Evelyn Benenson Professor at Randall University. And he is one of the pioneers uh, of uh, geometric group theory. And uh, Danny Weiss will continue this introduction and say some more words. And uh, I'll the uh, okay. 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 This is easy. Uh, this is a, a sparkling, positive, energetic uh, role model. Uh, say it again, role model. Conscientious, insightful, <laughs> lovely, beautiful person. My goodness. Uh, um, you, we, there's, a, there's a myth about mathematicians that. Uh, um, just because they're you know brilliant at math doesn't mean that they're brilliant in general about life, right? And there's just look around the room. <laughs> um, but this is the counterexample uh, with an amazing judgment. Is I think the the, the big word. She has amazing judgment. I shouldn't even remember. I I consulted her a bunch of times over my career. Uh, I remember her when uh, um, I was just starting and she was you know, a big figure already then. Um, um, leadership is a big word over here. In fact, uh, I just jotted my, my thoughts down of, of just, just after leaving the two friends who right, you know, right working on math here together. And they started listing, oh, she did this, she did that, she did whatever. Um, uh, basically, it, we felt like we've been uh, sharing, geometric group theory community felt like we've been sharing her. With the, with the math community. That's the way, that's what we felt. And I think it's it's almost over, right? Or it's over, it's over. <laughs> thank, thank God it's over. So when we mentioned her as a um, as a, uh, a candidate for Eisenstadt uh, chair to uh, uh, the administration, after two different administrations, um, uh, we got a celebratory yes, enthusiastic yes, which was really nice. Um, uh, they were so happy because I, I, she also was lead. They knew her. She was leading here as well at the CRM. So uh, um, uh, quickly, I'll let's end this. Uh, geometric group theory. Uh, um, you, some of you know, uh, started with a kind of confluence of uh, uh, new people, me, um, together with um, some high dimensional like topologist type people. Um, sort of came down a little bit to work in this area and. Uh, combinatorial group theorists who kind of rose up, some of them drowned, but uh, they made it. 
Uh, Ruth actually started, I think, in uh, astrology, but doing K theory. Is that is that fair to say? Early in my career. Yeah. Oh, oh, early. Oh, right. yeah, you start at the beginning, early. Yeah. So, um, and then did a few years of mapping class groups. Sorry, you know, it's whatever. <laughs> and then, and then she hit gold. And she got into the Coxeter stuff, the, and some hyperplane complement stuff, but the art and stuff, the right angled art and group stuff. That's the most important area in the field. <laughs> I mean, you're, uh, obviously. And uh, she, uh, if, if the place where you see that uh, interplay between topology, geometry, uh, uh, combinatorics, and algebra, which is what Ruth has been doing. Um, she was a pivotal leading pioneer in the area, sniffed out where all the good stuff was for the rest of us. And uh, she must have uh, had, uh, you know, it must be must have been fun since then watching how it all uh, took shape. So uh, uh, let's uh, now enjoy the treat of getting a survey uh, on, on the topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danny. That was the most embarrassing. <laughs> Um, so, it, as, as it was explained, this is a public lecture, a, gen, a very general lecture. I am not going to assume that everybody knows what geometric group theory is. I'm going to start at the beginning and, and try to make this as accessible as possible to a broad audience. So, that's a sort of apology to those of you who are experts already in the field. That uh, this is not aimed at you. Okay, so let's. Um, so, um, the title of my talk is from Ray Groups to Art and Groups. Um, but before I jump into the main topic, uh, I just want to put this in a little bit of context. So um, we all learn mathematicians, you know, in under, as undergraduate graduate students or whatever, you take some topology course and you learn the basics of algebraic topology. So what's algebraic topology? We you start with a topological space and you associate it to it certain groups, homotopy groups, or homology groups, or cohomology groups. And then you study the groups to understand your space. The groups encode information about the space. You want to know two topological spaces are homeomorphic. You check whether their groups are, are isomorphic, etc. So you, you study the algebra in order to learn about the geometry, in order to learn about the topology. Okay. Well, geometric group theory, which um, was a subject that really took off and really originated in the um, early 1990s um, due to some work of Gromoff. Goes the other way around. So what do we do? We start with a group we're interested in learning something about, and we associate to it a topological space, more specifically a metric space, on which the group acts as a group of symmetries or isometries or whatever you want to call it. So we, we think of the group as being a, a group of isometries of some metric object, some geometric object. And then we study the geometry to learn about the algebra of the group. All right, so it's sort of the reverse, um, the reverse idea. All right. Um, so uh, yeah, I started out doing algebraic topology and spent most of my time thinking about the algebra. Now I do the metric group theory and spend most of my time thinking about the geometry. Right. Mm -hmm. So okay. So I'm going to tell you in today's talk about a particular class of groups which um, I worked on over the years off and on um, are extremely interesting and present a huge number of open problems. So I think they're a wonderful um, uh, class of groups to be thinking about. And I want to tell you about, oh no, here we go. It's going to make yeah. you... Uh... Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't. No. I should have set this so it doesn't shut itself off. Okay, so let's I'll, move on. I'll just give it a wiggle every once in a while. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Just touch the air. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, so um, so I want to tell you about art. So I'm going to tell you about art and groups um, and a geometric group theory approach to these groups. How, how some of the things we're doing to try to understand these groups. All right. So uh, um, the, the talk has sort of three parts. Um, first of all, what are they? I'm going to introduce um, um, some examples and 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 a definition of art and groups. Talk a little bit about what we do and don't know about these groups, and then finally try to explain something about how we can use geometry to help understand them. Okay, so that's our goal. All right, so what are art and groups? Well, um, I'm gonna start out with, uh, so, so that I, they're not too abstract, I wanna start out with a concrete example that many people are familiar with, which is gray groups, all right? 
So what's a play group? Well, I've been noted by BN, the play group on N spans. So we have N pieces of string. We start with N points, you know, and we tie N pieces of string, and then we start braiding it. Right, we do this, and then we reattach them to the same end points down, down here. All right, that's a braid. Intuitively, that's a braid. Um, but now we want to turn these braids into a group, so we have to be able to multiply them together. We need uh, some kind of multiplication. So what is it? I have two braids, and I want to multiply x braid x times braid y. I simply concatenate. I attach braid y below braid x, and I get a, a new longer braid. All right, so multiplication concatenation. Um, and you can check that that forms a group. Um, so intuitively, that's how I'm thinking of break groups. But we're gonna, let me give you a, a somewhat more formal definition. So the more formal definition is given by a presentation, namely a set of generators and a set of relations that describe the group, that give you a complete definition of the group. Um, okay, so the generators are, are um, at, I'll call SI, S1 to S um, N minus 1. Where SI is, I take the i string or whatever string happens to be in the i place at the time and cross it over the i plus first, right? Just interplane. Any braid whatsoever can be done by a series of these, right? I cross this, then this, then this. I just describe what order to cross them again. So these are generators. I can get every braid by a, by a sequence of doing these. And what kind of relations do they satisfy? Well, if I have two strings here and two strings here, which don't overlap, then it really doesn't matter which of those I do first, S I, S -I or SJ. Um, I, I should have said, I didn't, that um, a, a braid is up to what we call isotopy. That is, if I can change one picture to another without, un, without um, cut, you know, detaching any of the points, it's considered the same braid. I don't really care if I do this or do this, you know, it's, it's up to isotopy. Okay, so the point is, it really doesn't make any difference if I do S I or SJ first, as long as they don't interact. But now what if I want to interchange, say, um, one and two and two and three? So they do both involve string two somehow, all right? Is it still true that they commute? Well, let's try it. Let's just go that far. That, well, yeah, I'll, I'll move that up in a second. But it, it turns out if you draw what SI, SI times SI plus one is versus SI plus one times S, I've done S1, S2 here and S2, S1. Those do not, those are not equivalent. They do not commute. But if I like to make this braid a little more complicated and do S1, S2, S1, that's my picture on the left here, versus S2, S1, S2, I claim that those are now isotopic to each other. All that's happened is a question of whether I do this crossing before or after I go past this, this back, this line in the back. Yes, these are two isotopic. So they are considered the same braid. So that's a relation. Um, between two braids, which are adjacent to, you know, right next to each other. Well, it turns out that's it. The entire braid group can be described in terms of this presentation. Now the presentation, if I have generators, S1 up to Sn minus one, and then I have these two kinds of relation according to whether the string, whether the crossings are next to each other or, or not, okay? All right, so that's the braid group. Um, so now here's another group that's close to the associated with the group. If we were to stop paying attention to whether it was an over or under crossing and declare SI equal to SI inverse, SI inverse is cross on, I think, under the instead of over. Um, if I were to ignore that and, and, and not pay attention to over or under, then it turns out that all that matters in the end is where a string ends up. I don't care if it went under or over what. And so all I'm doing is taking those end points and permuting them, right? So what I get by adding this extra um, um, relation is the symmetric group on M1. It's just permutation of, of those end points. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, the symmetric group is very closely related to the break. And we'll come back to that later. Okay, everybody so far? All right. Let's give another definition of a braid group. So this one's going to be geometric. Right? Here's, a, here's another place the braid groups arrive, uh, come up and are really interesting. So they come up um, when we study what are called configurations. So what's a configuration? Is? So I have some space N, and let's imagine I have N robots sitting on this space. 
And I want them to move around the stairs. Like, for example, maybe my space drives the um, corridors in some warehouse, all right? And the robots have to move around this warehouse and collect boxes and move them to somewhere else and blah, 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 and blah, 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 okay? So I have the, I have this space that I'm allowed to, that my robots are allowed to move around in. And I'm interested in taking my N robots, programming them to do their work, and then they come back at the end of the day to where they sit. Okay, so what do I need to worry about? Well, I don't want two robots to run into each other. So I need to make sure that when I program what they're doing, I never have two of them in the same spot. Yes? All right, so I need paths in my space which don't intersect. Yes, or, or don't intersect at the same time. I mean, they don't run into each other. Okay, so um, let's uh, make that a little more formal. So I'm going to call the configuration CM, the configuration space of N points in X, is all the positions that the robots are allowed to take. Well, what is that? It's just N points, robot one, robot two, the position of the N robots, it's N points, such that no two of those points are equal to each other, right? Yeah, we just got to make sure that no two end up in the same spot. Okay, that's the configuration space. Well, what is this motion I'm trying to um, program? Well, motion can be thought of as a path in this space. All right, so if the end robots now get to move around this space, but they have to stay in this space. They're never allowed two of them to be in the same point. All right, so it turns out that what I was describing which is programming the robots to start somewhere, do all their work all day, and then end up in the same place as they started, is basically like a brain. It's watching them move around in a way that never it, it intercept each other. In fact, if I were to take my space X to be a, a, just a disk with n points in it, um, then the configuration space of that disk is exactly the um the, the the sorry loops in that configuration space are exactly the brain group. So the brain group can be described as the fundamental group, the space of loops of um of um endpoints in of this configuration space with one slight um correction, namely I'm not requiring that ro that the robot, if you look at the brain, the um we're not requiring that string one end up in position one and string two end up in position two. So I'm going to ignore, um, I'm going to ignore the order of where they end up. And that's just modding out by the symmetric. Group. We're just going to think of this as an unordered set of points instead of an ordered set of points. All right. So that's just a minor correction to, to get, to allow for play. things to end up in the same set of spots they were in, but not necessarily in certain order. Okay. All right, so that's second description. That's a geometric description of the brain, right? Okay, ready for our groups. So now we want to generalize these two ideas to a much larger set of groups. Okay. All right. So what's an art group? Well, I'm going to give you two descriptions: a presentation and a geometric description. So the presentation is um similar to the brain group. We're going to start with some finite set of generators, which I'll call S1 up to Sn. And I'm going to allow for relations which look like those brain relations, all right? Remember the brain relation, there was S, I, S, J equals S, J, S, I, or there were these length three ones. Well, now we let them be any length at all. Take an I and a J, two different I and J, and look at the alternating product, S, I, S, J, S, I, for some length, for a word of some length, which I will call M, I, J. If M, I, J was three, I'd be done here. If M, I, J is five, I'd keep going. You know, so M, I, J, I can just decide how long an alternating product. And I set that equal to an alternating product of the same length, but starting with the opposite element. Yeah. So I'm allowed to do that for any two generators. I'm also allowed to put no relation. I might decide two generators have no relation. They basically generate a free group. So, so in that case, I just say MIJ is infinity, but there's no relation. And that's just a shorthand for there's no relation in that in that case. Okay. All right. So um that's what I art group. Any any choice of MIJ here, you know, it's it is it gives me an art. So there's tons of them. All right. Um, usually, rather than write out the whole, you know, if you have ten generators, you don't want to write out all the all the um, um, relations. Usually, we encode this um, presentation in a labeled graph. So, what is my graph? So, gamma is going to be. Um, I'm going to turn this into a little graph. 
So the vertices are S1 to Sn. So I have n vertices, which I label S1 to Sn. And I put an edge between any two vert vertices where Mij is not infinity. So it means there is a relation between these two vertices. I put, a, I put an edge and I label it with this integer Mi, natural number Mij, all right? And so rather than write out the whole presentation, I just draw a picture of the graph and then I call the, the corresponding partner group A gamma. All right, so here's two examples. If gamma is um, three generator, it is three vertices, and the edges are labeled three, three, and two, all right, that means I have three generators, and um, these two commute, these two satisfy that grade relation, SIA, and these two satisfy that grade relation. Well, guess what? This is the grade group on four strands, all right? It's just got all the relations are either length three or length two, and you know, I can make the braid group on any um, any um, length, easily draw the picture of, of just but twos or threes on, on the appropriate edges. Okay, so that is the braid group. All right, here's another one. I didn't say my graph had to be connected. Maybe it's not even connected, it's possible. Um, so how about if I have three generators again, and I put a two uh, here and, and, and don't even connect this S3 to the others. What does not connected mean? It means that there is Mij is infinity with these two and Mij is infinity with these two. So what have I got? Well, these two S1, S2 generate a Z cross C. They commute, Z cross C. And then the other generator, S3, has no relation at all with those. So we get a free, a, a free plot with the Z. All right, this is a special case of something called a right angle Arden group. A right angle Arden group means that all the edges are labeled two. There can be infinities and there can be twos. That's it. That's all you're allowed. Okay, so this is a, an example of a right angle Arden group. Okay, so um, um, so that's so that's the presentation of an Arden group, a, a gamma, given by, given by a graph gamma. And just like before, if we add another relation that S squared, SI squared equals one, or in other words, SI equals SI inverse, we get another well-known group. Namely, we get something called a Hoxie group. Hoxie groups appear all over mathematics. And in my experience, a lot more people know about Hoxie groups than Martin groups. Um, um, they're very common, the current representation theory, et cetera, et cetera. And not only that, they're made after a very famous Canadian mathematician, so it's not a good thing to talk about here. Okay, so um, so Coxer, so for every graph, every label graph gamma, I have a Coxer group and an Arden group. They're very close to each other. These two groups, cl classes of groups. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the sort of algebraic description of what Arden groups are. Let's move on to a geometric description of what Arden groups are. All right. So. Um, um, <clears throat> This is going to at first sound different from configuration spaces, but it turns out it's not so different. So uh, let's we'll start with the Cox groups. So one of the things that Cox groups are known uh, for is that they can be realized as reflection groups, discrete reflection groups, acting on, well, Rn, or I want to complexify it and, and make it uh, act it on, on complex things. All right, so they act as reflection. I can always realize a Cox group as a group in which the generators are acting as reflections in, in, in CN. Okay, what's a reflection? Well, a reflection means it fixes some um, co-dimension one subspace, and well, it flips something. It flips uh, um, some edge, not necessarily orthogonal. We don't try to do that. But in any case, it flips something. It, the, the one side to the other side. Okay. All right. So um, I want to let's name. Supposing I have a reflection. By the way, the reflections can be the generators or conjugates of the generator. So there are a bunch of reflections. So for each reflection, I want to call H sub R the hyperplane fixed by that reflection. All right. So it's a complex hyperplane. Remember, complex is codimension one in complex, but it's codimension two in real real codimension two. So so um, just keep that in mind. Um, because, because we're going to remove these hyperplanes. So if you remove a hyperplane from Rn, you separate the space. But if you remove a hyperplane from Cn, you don't separate the space, but you create fundamental group. You create holes in the, in the space. All right. So the hyperplane complement associated to this Coxeter group. Uh, um, I'm sorry. We not, uh, yeah, associated to this Coxeter group, we have something called the hyperplane complement, which is Cn with all of these hyperplanes removed. All right. 
it turns out what's left here, W, the, the cockstrip still acts on this, but now it acts freely on this. There are no more fixed points. We removed all the, we pulled out all the fixed points. All right. So we have this nice um, free action on this hyperplane complement. Um, let's look at an example. All right. Supposing we take our favorite cockstrip group, namely the symmetric group, which we've already seen, and we want to act it as a group of reflections on complex end space. Well, the way it acts is just by commuting coordinates, right? You just say you see n, you have n, n, n set of set of n ordered points, and you just commute the coordinates according to the, to the permutation. All right, what are the fixed, what are the reflection hyperplanes? Well, the hyperplanes, a reflection switches two coordinates, the i's and the j's coordinates. That's a reflection, all right? And the fixed set is the set where the i coordinates equals the j coordinate, right? What happens when I remove all the all the hyperplanes? Well, I'm precisely removing all the points um, where two where two coordinates are equal. I now what I'm left with is points in in complex n space um, where no two points are equal. So, yeah. Well, this is the configuration space of the complex plane. Or if we shrink it a little, it's the same as the configuration space of the disk. How many were there? How many were there? This is just the configuration space of the disk, and its fundamental group we just saw is the break. All right. Okay. So in this example, our hyperplane complement is uh, is exactly our configuration space, and up to modding out by by the symmetric group, we get the break. All right. Well, it turns out this is always the case. This was a theorem of um, Van der Leck from, uh, I forgot to look that up. It's 83 or 84, somewhere in the 80s, um, um, who, who proved that for any Cox group, any Cox group W gamma, if we look at the hyperplane complement, mod out by W gamma, the fundamental group is the part group. And this was a lot of the reason people a lot of is what first stimulated interest in art and groups actually was people were studying these hyperplane complements on um, people in singularity theory were trying to build blah 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 blah, blah and these art groups just showed up they just showed up and that and and that's where the um, interest a lot of the interest started okay so the art and groups have both this nice um um uh algebraic description in terms of in terms of presentation and this geometric description which is very uh natural and, and sort of arises uh, naturally all right well it turns out um um uh, yeah i'm going to mention this because it's going to lead into the next section that i'm going to talk about it turns out that the connection between the art group and the hyperplane complement is even stronger than that so um, it's a theorem of Deline uh, from the 70s that in the case where W is a finite Coxer group, so Coxer groups can be finite or infinite. By the way, art groups are always infinite because there's no, the generators have infinite order. And that's not, anyway. But in the case where the Coxer group is finite, um, this hyperplane complement is not just has fundamental group, the art group, but it's actually what's called a Ka gamma one space. So what does that mean? Um, so uh, for any group, a KG1 space is also known as a classifying space for the group. Um, technically, for map, formally, that means its fundamental group is, is your group G, and it has no higher homotopy groups at all. Um, but it, never mind what it means formally. Informally, for those of you who aren't used to working with these things, just think of it as a topological picture of the group. It encodes in a top topological space anything one might want to know about the group. It's, it's, a, it's a classifying space, a model for your group. All right. So, in other words, um, this hyperplane complement is is really it's incredibly closely connected. And if we can understand the hyperplane complement, we can understand the group. So that's the that's basically the the idea. Okay. All right. So um, we know that this is true for finite Coxeter groups. And one of the big um, open conjectures about art and groups, one of the big open questions about art and groups is whether this is true for infinite, for when W gamma is infinite. All right, it's for all art and groups or just for the, or just for the um, ones corresponding to finite Coxeter groups, okay? So this is a big open question. And, um, um, 
Oh, and yes, I just noted again, we already know that it has the right fundamental group. What's left to prove is it has no higher homotopy, or in other words, that the universal cover is contractible. That's what's that's what's unknown. That's the open open feature. All right. And it turns out that when we know this is true, we're going to know a lot more. We're going to know more than just that. It has a lot of other implications. So that brings me to um part two, which is what do we know, what do we not know about our so I said, part of the reason that I find them so fascinating is that there's lots of stuff we don't know. Oh, um, okay. So first of all, um, I, I've already kind of mentioned this, but let's be more specific about this. So we generally divide language into two classes, which we call finite type, or some people prefer the word spherical type, either, either terminology works, but um, I'm going to call them finite types so it's easier to remember what this means. Finite type and infinite type. Um, what does that mean? Well, finite type is any order group whose corresponding coxer group is a finite group. And infinite type is any order group whose corresponding coxer group is a finite group. As I said, the order groups themselves are always infinite. But we're talking about finite type and infinite type, meaning that the corresponding coxer group is finite. Okay? All right. So here's the thing. Um, we know an awful lot about finite type R and groups. Okay, there's still some other things. But basically, we know, you know, almost everything you would want to know about finite type ones. Why? Well, the reason is that they have a very nice combinatorial structure called the bar size structure. It gives you um, canonical forms for words and, you know, a, a best possible way to express every element in terms of your generator. It gives you um, tells you all kinds of, I mean, it gives you algorithms to solve all kinds of problems. And, um, um, uh, and because of this combinatorial structure, we basically can answer most algebraic questions about these groups. And we're really understanding quite well, right? These, this does not exist for most infinite type white groups. I just wrote with a few exceptions here because recently, it's been shown that you can extend these to what are called Euclidean um, art and group, extend, come up with sort of gar side like structures for Euclidean art and group. And there's been a lot of progress on those groups using, using this. But most infinitized art and groups do not have gar side structures, and we don't have any way, we don't have any techniques for, for um, uh, answering our questions. We can't even tell when two words in the generator, if you write out a, a product of generators, and a different product of generate, do they represent the same element of the group? We have no idea. Not only don't we have an algorithm to solve this, but it's not even known if there exists an algorithm. I mean, even abstractly, if there exists an algorithm, all right? This is what's called the solution to the word problem. We really have no idea. Okay, we have a presentation, but we don't know how to use it, basically, is what it comes down, all right, to, to really answer our question. Okay, so, um, what would we what what would what we think should be true? What are we trying to answer about infinite type R groups? So here are a few conjectures and questions that people are attempting to answer about about infinite type R groups. Um, all right, the first is what's called the K pi one conjecture, and I already told you what that was. Namely, the K pi one conjecture is the statement that that hyperplane complement is a classifying space for the group. All right. So, um, and actually, I didn't write it on here, but it turns out um, that some some work of myself and um, Mike Davis, we actually showed that if this was true, then we could build a very nice um, so-called finite K pi one space for the we, that and I was playing how is a little complicated, but we can reduce that to some nice finite um, K pi one space, which we can really um, use to compute things, you know. So if, if it solved the K pi one conjecture, you get that. And once you get that, you get a lot of other um, information. For example, is, is there any portion in here? Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't know. But if the, if the K pi one conjecture is true, then it would immediately follow that it has no portion. I mean, a lot of these things follow once you know the K pi one conjecture, which is why it's so important. We get a lot of other information. Okay, so we don't know. Is A gamma torsion free? We think so. We think it's as conjectured that it is. Where it, it's conjectured that um, that if it's not a product of two smaller art and groups, then it has trivial center. Um, um, we don't know. Um, it's conjectured that it has solvable word problems, which I just talked about. Is there a way to decide when two words are are, are um, equivalent? And solvable conjugacy problem: when are two words when are two words conjugate to each other? Um, the isomorphism problem. This is wide open. Um, given two different graphs, 
Um, could they, when do they generate isomorphic iron groups? Well, it's possible, it happens, but we don't really have a good, uh, a, a good, um, you know, a full picture of when that can happen and when that can't happen. Um, do we know anything about the automorphism or outer automorphism groups of these? So, for example, there's a lot of study about automorphism groups of free groups. Free groups are a special case of our where so the graph is just a bunch of disjoint points. But we don't know more generally. All right, what do we know? Um, does do does a gamma act nicely on some of these geometric spaces that we all know and love, like um, a hyperbolic spectral digit? This is the geometry here. You know, uh, uh, hyperbolic spaces would act nicely on a hyperbolic space. Well, yes, with that, it's basically almost never. But maybe that's you know asymmetrically hyperbolic or hyper or or, or or hierarchically hyperbolic. But maybe we can get some nice hyperbolicity aspect of these things, right? Okay. So there's tons and tons and tons of interesting problems out there. And um, recently, there's been an amazing amount of work on this and um, 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 using, um, using geometry, using geometric methods. So we don't have these combinatorial methods, but we have geometric methods to answer some of these problems. Okay? So I'm going to, um, um, in, in, in the, um, Rest of the talk, what I, I want to talk about a little bit, um, I'm going real fast, I mean, I'm early. In any case, I want to talk about how we can use geometry to help us answer some of these questions. I'm going, you know, obviously, this is a, a general audience talk, and I don't have that much time. So I'm going to just sort of throw a few ideas at you. Those of you who want to know more, my talk on Friday, I'm going to go actually into some details on some of, uh, on some of the things I'm, I'm just going to throw out here. So some of the um, just ideas, and we'll talk about them in more detail on Friday. Okay. So, okay. So how do we use geometry? So back, so we're back to the beginning of the talk. Now. What is geometric group? I mean, how can we use geometry to tell us about a group? What, what, what are we using? All right. So the idea um, is that we need to find an action of our group that we're studying on uh, some um, nice metric space. Um, what's nice? Well, um, usually nice means that it, uh, most the most the most useful um, spaces in, in geometric group theory are ones that have some form of non-positive or negative curvature. Well, what does that mean? Well, of course, um, you know, we all heard the word curvature from, you know, analysis, right? The curvature for a Riemannian manifold. But um, it, what really in the beginning, when, I, when um, Romoff introduced this geometric group theory, what one of the main things that, that got it started was that he introduced various notions of non-positive curvature that made sense on like, Simplicial complexes or um, cubical complex complexes built out of cubes or or um, um, cell complexes or you know things in all kinds of topological spaces. He introduced um, various notions of what it means to be non-positively curved and showed that if you had such a metric that was non-positively curved, you could conclude all kinds of um, interesting things. For example, um, there's one called cat zero. Geometry. Those cat zero spaces are always contractible. We want to show something that's contractible. Well, let's see if we can put a cat zero metric on it. Okay, so so these metrics give you a lot of information about the space. So nice usually means some form of non-positive curvature. There are a lot of variations on what that can be, but um, um the other thing we would like is that the action is nice. So to get the really, really strong results that Gromov was was um, talking about. You need the action. Well, obviously, you want it to preserve the metric. The um, point is that it doesn't preserve the metric. So it has to preserve the metric, but we would like it to be proper and co compact. So, proper in particular will imply that point stabilizers are finite. You don't have huge pieces of your group just collapsing on a single point. So, point stabilizers are finite. And co compact just kind of means that it sees the whole space. There's not, there's not stuff out there that you never get close to. I mean, you get, you get. Sort of close to everything. So, all right. So, you'd like things to be um, distance preserving, proper, and co compact. Um, can't always do that, it turns out. Um, but, and in fact, the, the, um, the actions I'm going to tell you about in a minute here are not proper. 
they said they are compact and they all do preserve distance, but they're not proper. But it turns out that it's, you can still get a lot out of that. So um, um, e even even when you can't make the action quite as quite as beautiful as you'd like, you can still get a lot of information. Okay, so um, here are some. I'm going to tell you about some spaces we're actually using to study to study these groups. All right. Um, all right. So I need to um, uh, define something. Supposing I have a subgraph delta of my defining graph gamma. So gamma is going to define my R group A gamma, and inside gamma, I have I look at some subgraph. And when I and I'm always going to all my subgraphs are going to be what we call full subgraph which means you pick out the vertices and then you connect them by edges if and only if they were connected by edges in that. You just take all the edges that were there before with their limits, along with their limits. Okay, so if I have such a subgraph, then I have a sub Artin group. I have an Artin group generated by delta, and it turns out that the obvious map from A delta into A gamma, which takes generates to themselves, is an injection. That's actually was a theorem of, of um, um, I guess. Um, um, so it, it, so it, it is, it, it generally injects in, in, into A gamma. Um, and we call the image a special subgroup. These are called special subgroups, the ones that are generated by subgraphs, right? For subgraphs. Um, okay, so I'm going to build a complex out of these things, um, not just the special subgroups themselves, but cosets of special subgroups, all right? So I take this special subgroup. Um, a delta, and I multiply it um, by an element of my big group, A gamma, all right? And I get a coset. And I want to think of the collection of all such cosets, all such deltas. I, let, I allow any delta inside gamma and any and any A, all right? This is a partially ordered set. It's ordered by inclusion. One coset can sit inside another coset, right? So it's partially ordered by inclusion. Well, whenever we have a coset, a partially ordered set, we can associate to it what's called the geometric um, realization of the partial ordered set. What's a geometric realization? Well, let's actually do it. I'm going to take the geometric realization of this of this set. Well, I put down a vertex for each element in my set. That means each one of these cosets now represents a vertex. And I connect two of these by edges precisely when one of them is contained in the other. If there's a related nucleus, if there's a less than relation between them, I connect them by an edge. And then I just fill in simplicity whenever I see the one still in the simplex. Right? Whenever I see a collection of things that all that all connected by edges, I just fill in simplex into that. Okay. All right. That's the geometric realization. All right. Well, it turns out. Um, um, oh, sorry, I, I, I should say here that I don't want delta to be all of, if I allow delta to be all of gamma, then this um, space becomes uninteresting. So I, I, I don't, I want it to be a problem, a problem subset, okay, in, in this case, all right? So, um, all right, so that's called the Artin complex, all right? It builds, I get this simplicial complex, it's called the Artin complex, and it's pretty clear that there's an action of, um, of a gamma of the art of the full art group a gamma on this simply by left multiplication. You take a coset, you multi left multiply by an element of the group, you get another coset. And if, if this coset's containing this and I multi left multiply both of them, they're still contained. And you, you, you get an action that preserves the it preserves the structure. Okay. Um, okay, so that's called the Arden complex. There are two other closely related complexes that I want to mention. Um, one is called the clique complex, the clique um. And that's the same thing, except instead of allowing all subgraphs, I only allow the subgraphs of gamma that generate a clique. In other words, any uh, subsets of generators where every every generator is connected to every other by an edge. A clique is just a, a, a subgraph that, that where any two elements are connected. All right, so my graph can be anything. I would see R tray. It can have clique, lots of cliques in it, or very, you know, I mean, it, it could be just one big clique, and you know, so so um um so the clique complex allows um um only the deltas which stand a clique, all right. But other than that, I do the same thing I did before. It's just a subcomplex of this other thing, all right. Similarly, the lean complex, which was originally introduced by the lean and the finite for finite um toxic, finite type art groups. Um, I only allow the deltas where the special subgroup generated by delta is finite type. Okay, this is an important concept. 
I start, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand a gamma where it's thinking. All right, that's, that's my, the whole problem here. So a gamma, gamma is generally a gamma is infinite by q. But inside that, there might be lots of finite type stuff. For example, any edge, any two generators connected by an edge generate a finite type. Right. Right. And so there, there can be there can be lots of little sub things that, that are finite type. They, they, these these special subgroups. All right. So in the Deline complex, I'm only going to allow the ones that are finite type. That, that's all I'm going to take. All right. And that's again a subcomplex of this whole. All right. So there here are three simplicial complexes. A gamma acts on each of these by left multiplication. And um, let me also mention because yeah, this is going to come up. Um, in, in a minute here, um, that what is the state? Remember, I said you know to be a proper acting one stabilizer to be finite. What's the stabilizer of one of these words? Well, the stabilizer of the coset a delta is is what is a conjugate of a delta. It's a it's it's a, it's this thing. A, too many a's. A a delta a inverse. <laughs> the G, um, um, Okay, so um, it, and this is called a parabolic subject. It's a conjugate of a simple thing, and it's called a parabolic subject. So these things are not conjugate. It's not big stabilizers, but these stabilizers are just kind of smaller Artin groups, is what they are. They're just Artin groups with smaller graphs, and so you know you got kind of inductive arguments and things that allow you to reduce to to smaller chunks. So yeah, the action's not proper. We wish it was, but it's still extremely useful. It turns out. All right. So um, here are a few things we've learned. I can't. I don't have. Um, it, it, I don't have time um, to you know explain how to get all these results. But I would just like to mention a few things we've learned from these actions. All right. So um, um, let's go back to the K pi one conjecture. So I, I studied this, Mike Davis and I got interested in this back in, in the 1990s. Um, and um, what we uh, proved, we, we introduced this. So Deline introduced a version of the Deline complex for finite type. And we were looking at the infinite type case. And what we proved was that um, this, this Deline complex, the, so the last of these, this, this guy, the last of these um, um, complexes I described, that the Deline complex um, is always, I mean, for any infinite type um, A gamma, is homotopy equivalent to the universal cover of the hyperplane complement, or in other words, the K pi one conjecture holds is true if and only if the Deline complex is contracted. Okay, so it's if and only if. And as I said, once you know that the Deline, the K pi one conjecture is true, you can get a lot of information about the other conjectures pretty quick. All right. So, um, so of course, we'd like to prove it's contractible. How do we do that? Well, often geometry can help us do that. So, for example, if it, it has a cat zero metric or something nice like that, then then we get we quickly can deduce that it, that it is um, contractible. So, a um, lot of people have worked on this by all different methods by putting different kinds of geometry. I mean, Mike Davis and I just uh, basically. But show that some of these complexes have um, cats or cubical metrics, um, but only in special cases. I mean, it's not always true, but it's true for certain ones you can put cubical metrics on. Um, and various people who are sitting, several of whom are sitting in this audience have proved um, contractibility by, by studying various um, nice geometry, by, by um, showing that, that um, D gamma can, Support certain really nice geometries. There is a there is a um, metric on the gamma. By the way, when I say different geometries, uh, what I'm really talking about is putting different metrics on the gamma, and the different metrics give rise. So so the cubical metric is only cat zero for certain. I can tell you exactly which ones it's, it's cat zero for and which ones it isn't. Um, the you know we can we can do the gamma as either a simplicial complex or a cubical cubical complex. There's metrics on simplicial things that are that are you know injective or nice in some way. Um, so so by if, by putting different metrics on it, you can use different techniques to try to show that that, that these things hold. And in fact, there is a metric called the Mousson metric, which is conjectured to always 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 be cat zero. But anybody who's tried to prove 
uh, that abstract um, piecewise Euclidean um, metrics of path zero knows how hard that is once you get above dimension two. So it, it's we think it's true, but you know we don't have a way to prove it. So um, okay, so there's been a lot of work on this, and we now know for all kinds of different classes of ga a gamma that this is true. Right? It's still not known in general, but we're making real progress on it. Um, okay, here's another one. Um, it turns out that that Cleek cube complex is always, 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 always cat zero. It's cubic that we can. I've described it as a simple complex, but it's easy to think of it. It's easy to um, view it as a cube complex instead. You just ignore some of the edges, but it, it's easy to think of it as a set of cubes. You put um, the standard cubical metric on this, and it's always, always, always cat zero. Isn't that great? So what can we learn from that? Well, it turns out that what, what we get out of that, because C, unlike D gamma, D gamma tells us everything about the, C gamma is not related to the K by one. I mean, we don't get the K by one conjecture from knowing C gamma is compatible. So what do we get? Well, um, the, there's um, um, the, the sort of most important theorem, there's been, it's been used for a number of things, but the most important theorem is that it, it's allowed us to prove that any of the conjecture, pretty almost more or less any of the conjectures, if we know they're true for every clique subgroup, every clique um, delta in our in our in our graph, then it's true for the whole graph. So we can reduce the question to the case where our graph is a single clique. All right. If we could prove it there, we've got a friend. All right, so that's a nice theorem. All right, doesn't doesn't give you everything, but it it it, it it's a good a reduction. Okay, all right. Um, um, one more I'm just going to mention briefly. Um, but there's a zillion more. Um, we um it is uh, re recently so so that's the clique complex and the Deline complex. Recently, people have started using the um. Arden complex, which is the biggest of these, where we allow all the all the subsets. Um, and they um, used it for all different things. One that interests me particularly, and I'll talk about, I'm going to be talking about, especially on Friday, is um, understanding um, the structure, or understanding parabolic subgroups and how they and how they interact with each other. For example, basic questions like whether the intersection of two parabolic subgroups is a parabolic subgroup is unknown. And, and you know, all kinds of basic questions about parabolics. And um, I think there's some really cool stuff going on about that. And uh, as I said, I'll talk about that a little more. I'll, I'll talk about that on Friday. Um, so yes, uh, Complino Martin Vaspu and Luke Spoon and various people in the audience have worked on some of these problems, right? So um, this is just a, a case. Um, I, I, I'm excited. So we had uh, these mini courses introducing us to all different kinds of geometries and what they can do for us. And I would say more or less every one of these has been used to tell us something new about Arden groups. So Arden groups present us with, I think they're important groups, but they're also um, a great source of problems. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I'm going to quit there and thank you very much. <laughs>
And for every other point, I just I just start sliding it along the geodesic unit. And I do that simultaneously with everything. And when you know, I can track it in my space. So okay, so you immediately get the track down. Um, if it's if it adds an addition, a cubical structure, then the cubical structure comes along with combinatorial information as well as as well as just this geometric information. And that's extremely strong. I mean, that's that's really <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, that has even more information. Um, and, and other other types of geometries, it, 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 it's similar. You get, you, you either get some, um, the, if, if, if it's a geometry based on some simplistic structure, you may get, you may actually get combinatorial information out of, out, out of some ways of picking a best, you know, if there's some way of picking a best possible path from here to here, that's like a canonical form. And then you can ask, if two points are close, are the paths close? You know, can I get an automatic structure, a bioautomatic structure? Um, you know, so you get all this, all this combinatorial information, um, and as well as geometric information. Why is it not working? It's not. I mean, some of these things don't work. Like you definitely, you don't have to stay close to each other. They don't have to meet. That you know, you lose just too much information when you don't have the. Um, it doesn't have some kind of non positive sort of things to don't stay, they don't behave well, they go all over the place. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answer helps, but <laughs> so you have like a long list of conjecture. Um, are there any like backwards implications like any of those for combinations of them? Maybe why the case? Oh, well, yeah, I mean. I mean, and then, 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 then go this way, you know, like, you now take on one other, if, if it's the yeah, next portion, then take on one that could fail. I mean, it's, uh, um, yeah, I don't, um, no. I mean, some of them are interesting in their own right, whether or not we can put it on. It's just, um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think, I don't know if another direction is just good. Good question. That guy. Oh, has anybody has anybody started started off with showing us pictures of trades? Yeah. Right? And then you, you know, with the arguments and so forth. But trades have this very nice childish interpretation, right? Very attractive interpretation. Has anybody uh, successfully found some interpretation like that for, for art and groups? Well, it it it's the type of thing. Um, what do you mean? I mean, you don't. Why are you? Like, not... You could say, oh, from the message group, some right. right state okay. or whatever. But it, but in terms of a picture, a picture. I mean, I I don't think that's an outrage, but I doubt I'm the first person to ask that. No, I say, I mean, yeah, yeah. Did you have a? Yeah, I think that's the exact one. But I think type P or nothing class group so. You know, minus fists, and then you have like a ribbon. Oh, oh yeah, there are a few other cases. There are a couple of other specific cases. I would do like you can create intervals. Right. Right, right. No, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. There are there are there are a few other cases. And there's also, I mean, this isn't answering the question, but as I and said, also within family too. <laughs> But um, as I said, there's this actually extremely simple, not, there's this other complex which I didn't talk about, which is the Salvetti complex for any for any gamma. And it, it, that thing is a K by one space if and only if the, the ring complex, if and only if the um, hyperplane complement is a K by one space. That thing has one, it's a CW complex with one cell for each finite type subject. It's really easy to construct and look. I mean, it's like totally concrete. You know, you can you can construct this from very explicitly. Um, you don't know if it's always the case by one space, but you know, it is. It does in the in the um, finite case it is. So, but actually, no. In that case, I'm sorry. I take that back. Because then, yeah, I'm sorry. I said it was quite good. Can I ask another question? <laughs> um, I think I said the question on the table. My former chair is glaring at me. <laughs> Looking at what you should have done. So you mentioned the isomorphism problem, right? Yes. Yes. Are you uh, the hint from what you were saying is that 
you guys don't even know, uh, don't even have a conjecture of what might, what when two graphs give you the same. No, there's argument. some, there is. There is. There's, there's, a, somebody, can, there's a guess, someone here. Yeah, somebody answer that. Yeah. Um, so it's known that some are isomorphic by this twist um, operation, and the conjecture is that's it. That's the you know. Well, that's just a convention. And that's the question. Yes, how does the, the geometric group theory arose in, in Gromps? Gromps was well. Well, he introduced it. So, so, so it, was, it was, you know, I don't know how he first got interested in it. I mean, but, but, you know, he was differential geometry, obviously curvature was very meaningful for, for him. And this idea that you could introduce, you know, curvature for other types of spaces was completely um, out of nowhere that I know. I mean, it, out his head, it was like, um, 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 I, you know, I, I don't think, I don't know how it connects with what he did before that. It opened up a whole new area. And interestingly, he didn't really stay in that area. I mean, he went off and did other things while we Before that, he was doing symplectic to college. Sorry? Before that, he yeah, did symplectic to college. He had one paper there. And then he ran and we're still doing this, but he was kind of still, out there. Like, yeah, it was, I mean, you know, some people, uh, some of the ideas uh, go back to Max Gay work in the early yeah. 1900s. And, and what Gay was doing was studying groups that acted on classical hyperbolic, you know, like the hyperbolic plane, and showed that using the geometry of hyperbolic plane, you could use all kinds of algebraic facts about these groups. So they're fundamental groups of hyperbolic mathematics. Something he was interested in. Um, um, and it, you know, the, the claim is that somehow, I don't know if this motivated Grohoff or, you know, but it was sort of, an, you know, he took this sort of example and said, oh, you could do this for usually much, a uh, hugely bigger class of, of groups than they than, than have done before. Maybe, maybe he was influenced by some of the ideas of free elites about translation. Maybe. Oh, no. Maybe something he was, but it was a, it was a, he had a much grander viewpoint, and I think that some of his early, some of his early takes, I think we were from Stony Brook at the time, on on uh, how did what made what what the what the, the secret juice of hyperbolic space. Some of his early ideas weren't weren't right. Also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were brilliant, but they were, yeah, and they, he took off, he, he, he did amazing things, yeah. we're, yeah. We're, we're stuck there. Didn't, it didn't connect that closely to the other stuff he was saying, so I don't know where the, I, I don't know where the, sorry, I can't get inside the off screen. I don't know. I remember here, I don't know, there's an interview where he said, he was there, and I just, he was there. Yeah, amazing, amazing. It's also, it's also true that he, he, his, his early geometric group theory wasn't about hyperbolic groups either. It was a polynomial group. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's true. I forgot about that paper. That's true. Yeah, that was awesome. really the first the first paper where we signed by the polynomial group. Among all the tools that we've talked about for presentation theory is not there. Is there a reason why? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, you haven't talked about the presentation of the Arctic group. Would it be useful or you haven't talked about it? Yeah, it's like questions of like whether they're linear or no. like, well, you know, that was, you know, when he was deciding whether break was linear was took a lot was critical. And yeah. that was generalized to all finite type art and groups are not to be linear. Mm -hmm. It's not known for and I can add that to the uh, actually it's out there any cases that are known not to be does anyone know? As far as I know, 
Yeah, yeah, I know, but I mean, is anything at all known about? Well, okay, right angle. Yeah, there are capital prices that are not driven. But yeah, that could, I can add that to the list of, of, of open questions. Are they? So we don't, I guess we don't even know things like that. I mean, what other questions would be interesting? Classification of skin of irreducible representation. That's usually I see. debated. It's hard to hear a missionary. We're always looking for more people to join up into our field. <laughs> Representation theory is very welcome. Anybody else prejudice to go to the point of the point in chief? Yeah, no. 